So I just wanted to uh, first tell you just uh, what a sense of privilege to be doing this project here. I don't think I can uh, uh, make a project like this without being at UCSD, without being at Cal IT. Uh, this is really uh, a privilege in my life to be able to share a work like this with you. And uh, I wanted to tell you why this work uh, uh, has been um, uh, a kind of a passion for me uh, for a very long time and finally I have a chance it's because I'm here I can finally realize this project so this painter <coughs> Huang Bing Hong is his name he died in 1955 at age 90 uh, he um, was a great painter a great calligrapher a uh, great scholar a historian and uh, I uh, came upon his writings when I was a college freshman studying in the conservatory. That was the time when I decided I must um, uh, investigate my, uh, my, my cultural heritage. So uh, Huang Minghong was one of those great uh, uh, essayists uh, who wrote uh, a lot of books on traditional Chinese painting. And of all the books I have read, um, his writings are some of the most illuminating uh, writings. But it was so hard to, um, to actually see his uh, works. It was very, very hard to, because uh, uh, they're just simply not accessible. Um, here is Huang Ming Hong. Um, <coughs> and um, um, I, I put up these uh, photos here. Those are my notes from college times that I you know, hand copied his books um, and um <coughs> learned a great deal about. Uh, I felt that his writings held the key to, to traditional Chinese painting. So uh, as I always do, I hand copied them. And, uh, I went to many museums uh, looking for his works. It was very, very hard to see his works. So in fact, I traveled to Hangzhou where he last lived. Uh, in, um, and in his own studio, I only saw one painting by him. Uh, of course, there are reproductions, but <coughs> the most amazing moment came a few years ago after I arrived at UCSD. Uh, I was uh, in Berkeley giving lectures and I was introduced uh, through a wonderful composer friend, Ming Cao, uh, whose uh, father is a collector of paintings. And um, he said, well, you like traditional paintings, maybe you can stay with my dad. So <laughs> I met Mr. Zhong Ying Cao over here. <coughs> and uh, the first conversation we had was a long 10 hour, uh, kind of you can describe it as a, as a qualification exam. <laughs> <laughs> we went over all those names and history and all of that. And he, so we started to discuss Huang Bing Hong. And he asked me, why you like Huang Bing Hong so much? And we discussed all of that. Um, until he revealed to me, actually, he was a collector. He was a major collector of Huang Bing Hong's paintings. Um, and um, that night uh, was one of the most memorable evenings. He, he, he uh, let me hold a fan painted by Huang Bing Hong um, for the first time. And then uh, he was such a great gentleman. He invited uh, me and, and my family, my, my son, <laughs> uh, and my wife, uh, the next year to, to go visit him for three days. And he has 600 pieces by Huang Minghong. And here's a happy moment. My son has no idea what he's watching, but that's a great <laughs> masterpiece, uh, calligraphy uh, written by Huang Minghong. And um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Cao passed away uh, three years ago. And I've always wanted to do something about this particular um, uh, painter. And uh, through our mutual love for Huang Minghong, he also regarded Huang Minghong as the greatest painter. Um, his collection is very unusual. Here's the signature that, uh, uh, that is on this particular set of collection of paintings, album leaves. Uh, it's Ren Chen, that is the year, the lunar year. Uh, Bin Hong is his signature, his name, and this was in uh, when he was in Chinese uh, ages. He was 89. Uh, Western age he was 87. Um, there was a pivotal year in Huang Minghong's life. Uh, he painted uh, his kind of first mature paintings when he was 70, and he lived until 90. And this was the period when, um, when he was 87, his eyes were going blind, and it was within these few months that he painted the most amazing works. And the collection you just saw are from those few months. Um, and um, Huang Minghong was a great uh, um, um, theorist about painting, uh, following the great Guoxi tradition from the Song Dynasty. He has um, <coughs> uh, catalog cataloged uh, seven types of ink. Uh, I could pull it up here. Dark ink, light ink, breaking ink, accumulating ink, splashing ink, scorched ink, overnight ink. Yeah, and then he has nine types of water techniques. Um, 
yeah, I'm not, I couldn't even attempt to translate that into English. But basically, uh, what I wanted to do is first, I wanted to be able to share these works with you. And because of Mr. Cao and the, and the Mo Jai Foundation, uh, their generosity that we were able to borrow these paintings, uh, bring them to campus for two days, and we did uh, multispectral imaging of these works. Uh, and then I wanted to create music in a way that is very much inspired by uh, a traditional Chinese landscape concept about the genre of landscape painting, which is that uh, lands landscapes are not just objects for you to look at, they're objects for you to experience. So um, these paintings, as you see, <coughs> We can immerse in them. We can travel in these paintings. And then I also wanted to create music to annotate that journey. In a way, I wanted to compose music to curate a journey through these works. Um, so this is uh, what I did just here is, is just the beginning of, of a much larger project. Um, so today you hear the hearing landscape um, version of the work. And, um, and this residency at CalIT really has uh, fundamentally changed my approach to composition. Uh, with my team, a wonderful team of 10 people. Um, there are uh, audio uh, software developers, um, there are um, uh, cultural heritage engineers, uh, there are robotic engineers. Um, uh, I'm learning so much from all of my teamwork, uh, team, per, uh, uh, team workers. And um, here's a list <laughs> of the team, team members. Um, um, what this work has done for me is that I'm actually redefining my musical compositional process. Uh, and what you heard is the electric, electric version, electronic version of, of the first piece. Uh, but what, it, uh, what I'm doing now is that actually last week uh, a piano work was premiered that was based on an analysis of the sound that I generated. And I'm make, making music for acoustic instruments. And the culminating project will be um, this project right here. A Thousand Mountains, A Million Streams. It's a large scale uh, work for full orchestra that I intend to compose uh, uh, finish by, by the end of next year. Uh, it's a work commissioned by Boston uh, Modern Orchestra project. And I just want to mention two more things before I introduce uh, my team members. Uh, each will give you presentations. Um, the, um, the sound that you heard uh, in this piece <coughs> were part of the sound China Sound Archive that um, uh, I spent the first year with my wonderful research assistant, Yung Ping Chen. I believe he's here. Can you Wave your hand. <laughs> um, we uh, archived more than a uh, hundred hours of um, very precious recordings. Uh, some are uh, field trip recordings, some are uh, historical archival recordings. So that went into this piece. So the material that you heard today, <coughs> um, the, f the vocal music you heard, this whole piece you just heard came from only one song. Uh, it's a song called Shangqi Gao Shan Wang Ping Chuan. Basically, it's a song about uh, high mountains from north, uh, northwestern China. It was recorded in 1953, the same year that Huang Minghong painted this album. Um, and so the first uh, sound materials, uh, everything you heard in that came from this song, sung by Zhu Zonglu. And later on today, in the, uh, the last part of our presentation, you will hear a piece written uh, by Breck Sergis, uh, my research assistant. Um, he composes music with the music called Falling Water for Gu Qin. Uh, which is also a masterpiece um, recorded in the early 50s. Um, so it's around the time that Huang Minghong did these works. And the two materials, one is about high mountain, one is about uh, flowing water. The word mountain and water is the title that we use to describe landscape genre painting. So one is Shan, one is Shui. Um, with that, I would like to um, introduce um, uh, Professor Foco Cuester. Uh, to come to, he's the director of Chisa 3, and uh, his team played a major role in bringing the images here to you. So, welcome. So, thank you so much for the introduction. Again, my name is Falco Kuster. I'm a professor in the Jacobs School of Engineering, which means, most like I'm an en engineer by heart. I'm a computer scientist by training as of late. But over the last decade, I've really turned into what we call today a cultural heritage engineer. But we'll get to that later. So let's browse a little bit back in time. Roughly a year ago, uh, Leigh and I first met in a coffee shop of all places. And he said, Falco, I have this dream that I always had. There's this Chinese artist, painter, that many admire. 
truly, for his style, uh, for the pieces that he has created. Huang Bin Hong. And I have this vision, I have this dream to turn these paintings into a completely new way of experiencing them uh, through vision and through sound, going to the point where we can hear these landscapes as if we were there. And I said, wow, what I never told him is what actually part of that wow brought on. And that takes us a long, long time back, actually through space and time, to a point in time where my hair was not gray and the beard did not start to gray either. And that's an important part to remember as part of this story. So the year is 1985. Time, 12.30 p.m. in the afternoon. It's a wonderful June summer day. It's the location, the Huangshan Mountains, one of the areas that Huang painted as part of the landscapes he presented. It's roughly 3,000 feet above sea level, uh, the south face of a rock cliff. Sun is burning down at us. And I'm standing at that cliff, which has roughly a 70 degree angle, right? Bracing my back, hands against this cold, smooth rock, looking at this fantastic landscape in front of us, me and below me, right? Hearing those sounds coming through from the valley, and I can swear today there was this classical Chinese music filtering up, right, from all the way from the bottom of the valley. You hear the wind rushing by across uh, the stone. Uh, through the pine uh, trees uh, just below. And then this really unique mountain smell, right? Clean, fresh air, but the sense of essence of um, pine, right? But again, we're on this cliff. Looking up, there's this penalizing ascent waiting for us. Looking down, there's more or less instant death if you lose your footing. And so, since we like to self-punish, we decided, well, let's keep ascending, right, since we were already there. As uh, so we're climbing up that mountain, sun burning down on our backs, the rock face in front of us, and other climbers were descending at the same time. They had spent the night on top of the mountain in a former monastery. And there is, most of them are Chinese. Actually, all of them were Chinese. With this big grin on their face, this encouraging look, like right? sort of pushing us forward, keep on climbing. This is really worth it. Right? That was just amazing. The, the gesture of, okay, come, keep on going, take in uh, this amazing environment. Right? A sensory overload load through vision, through sound, through smell, through touch. Right? The mountain being right there. The entire landscape opening up in front of us. Halfway up the mountain, everything changed very drastically. The landscape was still beautiful. Right? The sounds were still there. It was still baking hot. We were sweating. Right? But part of the rock face completely changed. And it turns out that the Chinese monks literally had carved their legacy into the mountain, chiseling steps into the mountain face, handrails polished to completely smooth touch, right? Beautiful. But nevertheless, every single climber that was descending suddenly was lacking that smile, looking serious, concerned, questioning at us, which completely confused me because there was otherwise sensory bliss, right? And it didn't face me, it didn't really come to me until later that evening when we had set up camp on top of the mountain, really taking in that serene landscape, that halfway through the climb, after the hardest part was over, my climbing partner and I had changed roles. For the first part, I was carrying this rather heavy uh, climbing backpack. For the second part, we had changed it over. My climbing partner was my father. And at that time, interesting enough, almost to the date, he was exactly the age I am today. The difference, let's go quickly back to that one comment early on. He had long, white hair and a long, white beard. A sign of wisdom, age, right? Being one of the wise elders. Now, I was racing up the mountain, takes that picture, right? And that old, wise man behind me, hunched over with that heavy backpack, carrying it up the mountain, right? And suddenly it really was all clear why that 
perception changed. That bright smile to that question, you know, what are you really doing there? So why am I telling this? My kids are here, right? So lesson learned. <laughs> As a teacher, I always have to teach, right? That mind fake of sorts. What did you just learn? Respect your elders. That would be me today, right? <laughs> so very important. <laughs> Thank you. So, right, check. So the other part that really came, being on that mountain, being in that environment, seeing these monumental historic landmarks being constructed, those temples, those shrines, right, was a transformative and life-altering experience that really sets a seed for what we're here uh, doing here today at the Qualcomm Institute and at CESAR 3 the Center of Interdisciplinary Science for Art, Architecture and Archaeology today, which is we're looking at a science and engineering foundation to create a future for the past, right? So can we come up with an approach that allows us to document world cultural heritage, to understand its state of health, to tell its story, to inspire others, uh, to really stand up and to make sure that the world heritage that we have created will be there for our children in the years to come. Back in that coffee shop, sitting in front of that iPad, this tactile sensation again, rather than the rock wall, looking at the iPad, zooming into Hong's work on Lay's uh, uh, tablet PC. In this case, hearing the sound of others surrounding us, smelling coffee rather than pine tree. All of it came back into place. And that wow really made a lot of sense to me at that time. I said, we really need to do that. So thanks uh, to the Qualcomm Institute, Ramesh Rao and everybody else here, there is the Kalatitu Research Opportunities Program that is seeking to connect the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. The science and engineering rigor with a more creative expression of engineers, uh, of artists, musicians and otherwise. To look at new ways of telling that story about our world heritage in ways that inspires, intrigues, gets us to question it and really carry forward. Now we were able through at CESAR 3 to create an integrative graduate research, education and trainee program which looks at educating the cultural heritage engineer of the future. We have been lucky so far to touch 24 PhD students which we all believe will be the innovator of tomorrow really making sure right heritage will stay around. And one of these innovators is Samantha Stout. She's a material scientist, a PhD student most of all, reaching the end of her training. And she is ready to embark on that ultimate experience as well on her own to change world heritage as we perceive it. So, Samantha. Thank you very much. Okay, um, as uh, Professor Kuster mentioned, I'm a doctoral candidate in the material science and engineering program. Um, but over the past three years, I've also started calling myself a cultural heritage engineer. And so what does that mean? Um, I've been in Florence, Italy for three years, uh, mainly training with the founder of CISA3, Maurizio Serracini. And I've been working on um, basically ways to characterize and identify materials in art and cultural heritage, from archaeological artifacts, to paintings, to wall frescoes, to monuments and sites. And basically our CHISA3 team came together for a diagnostic imaging campaign of these watercolors by Huang Binhong. And we had a team of uh, people from many disciplines, so mechanical engineering, computer science, um, and myself. And we took a camera and we basically made this robotic hybrid imager uh, out of a 3D printer. And so uh, we printed a part uh, to put on top and, and mount the camera and the lights. And then we were able to use the robotic platform for an imaging campaign that included this stitched image of uh, 1,800 single shots. And we did that in, in, in different wave bands. Uh, different areas of the spectrum, in the infrared, in the UV, uh, with raking light, uh, to see the properties and to get a better look into uh, uh, the view of, of these uh, watercolor, watercolors by Huang Binhong. So multispectral imaging is part of the picture when we analyze a work of art. 
But it's really a multidisciplinary effort because this goes along with also our uh, art, histor art historical and archival research and other modalities like the analytics I do uh, with XRF and, uh, and chemical analysis. So here you can see basically all the potential diagnostic images we can take. Uh, visible light, as I said before, raking light, UV, and they all give us a different look into the work of art. So we can see the work of art through the eyes of a conservator, looking for vulnerabilities in the paper or uh, how it changed over time. We can see it in the eyes of an art historian, looking for technique and brush strokes and materials used. Or we can see it through the eyes of a cultural heritage engineer, looking for diagnostic information about how it was made, how it changed over time, and how to best preserve it. So now I'm going to show you the, the, the images that come from some of the, uh, the leaves in, in the album of watercolors that we had access to for two days. And different, uh, different wavelengths of light basically have different properties. And so in, s in some regions of the spectrum, like the infrared, pigments become transparent. And so in this infrared image, it's in black and white, it's grayscale, we can basically be looking through layers of paint to see which ones are more absorbent, like the overnight paint that Huang Bin Hong used, and, and which layers are, are more like washes and more transparent. <coughs> so this is the comparison. This is the visible image, what we can see with our eyes. And then the UV is more sensitive to what's on the surface, and certain organic components become fluorescent. So now we see these, there's some red spots here, and, and different, uh, looks like droplets or, or um, areas of, of, of paint that, that was there, but they're not visible in the, in the visible region. So maybe the artist spilled something or maybe uh, later on was touched up somehow. Um, and so the diagnostic exam opens up questions. So the last uh, multispectral image that I want to show you is called false color infrared. And it combines the visible and the infrared in, in a certain way that's sensitive to material properties and material characteristics. And it's really useful for discriminating against things that show up the same color, like a red lake or red cinnabar. And so for the, the, for the, um, the red that's present in, in some of the colors and the red that's present in the stamp, we were able to differentiate between these two techniques. So lastly, there's the analytical campaign, which is the XRF. And that's what I'm working with in, in terms of what we call chemical imaging. Um, XRF, basically, we uh, did a map of points, you can see on the right, where we analyze small areas. And what we get out is these spectra. And the spectra are tied to chemical elements, which chemical elements are present in that spot. And we were able to see that, basically, the blue of the shirt uh, of this, this man crossing on the bridge to home is a bromine dye. And we were able to see that, yes, that stamp is cinnabar. It's not Red Lake because we saw mercury and sulfur, which is cinnabar is mercuric sulfide. And so that gave us, here we go, <laughs> I'm standing up for a minute. Um, that gave us a look into the materials, which uh, is very pertinent for a conservator uh, to understand before doing a treatment or, or protecting a work of art. Um, and so we should have documentation of all this when we analyze art. And so lastly, I'm going to leave you with a, a raking image, which is shining the light at a very low angle. So it's just grazing the surface of the work. And here we can finally see the texture of the paper. And so as cultural heritage engineers, um, we, we take a holistic look um, at works of art um, mul many times in a multidisciplinary setting, and that that was basically coming together through this project um, in a way that hasn't happened before. And just to to reiterate, our robotic imager allowed us to do this in about a fourth of the time that it would have taken um, otherwise with conventional methods, and in a magnitude never before seen. Uh, lastly, the XRF again. Um, yes. These waveforms were actually transmitted uh, or, 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 or used by, by Greg, who will speak next, um, to create a, f a frequency filter. So now we've transferred material data 
into the sound space. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it to Greg to introduce his work. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Greg Sergis, um, PhD candidate in computer music program, uh, music department here at UCSD. Uh, and there I work on generative music and digital signal processing for synthesis and transforming audio. Uh, my role in the current project is actually sort of twofold. Um, so the first part of that is as an audio software developer. And I've been working in pretty close collaboration with Lay to create a set of tools um, for transforming audio and different uh, compositional tasks that felt pretty specific to this project and pretty necessary. Um, the other aspect of what I've been doing is uh, actually working as a composer, which is kind of a treat. Uh, and I've developed an interactive uh, system which uh, will allow you uh, to view paintings and sort of navigate through them uh, and create uh, a changing soundscape which responds to what you're seeing. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do is just talk about two of the tools. Uh, we have this large set of tools. I wanted to focus on two of them. Uh, the first is a, I guess what, what I'm calling a quarter tone filter, a uh, spectral filter bank. And so this allows uh, a composer to specify a set of pitches or a harmony and then filter a complex sound by it. So as you may or may not know, um, probably know, uh, any real world sound is a collection of multiple frequencies occurring simultaneously. Uh, and this tool allows for a composer to specify specific pitches uh, and then process the sound in such a way that only the frequencies which match up with those uh, specific pitches are actually heard, or what comes out of the filter. And so you've heard this already in Lay's piece, um, the sort of very pure sounding sustaining harmonies um, that I think are more or less throughout the piece uh, up until almost the end. Those are all the male singer's voice processed and then passed through this filter. Um, the second tool uh, that I wanted to talk about is what Samantha touched on, um, and this is working with the XRF uh, spectra data. And so, like paintings, sound has uh, a spectrum, uh, and where in the case of a painting, it sort of tells us what materials might be present at that particular point. Uh, in a sound, it tells us uh, which frequencies are present and uh, in what proportion or how, how loud they are. And so what we've done is made a, a filter which allows us to map the sort of visual spectrum or the, the spectrum from the painting onto a sound. And so we end up, in a way, sort of hearing you know, this, this tiny analysis point. Um, you've heard this as well, uh, the ending section of Lay's piece, which is uh, characterized by sort of noisy sounds and windy sounds. Uh, every single one of those different timbres is a different point uh, on the analysis. So in a way, it's a sort of sonification of what we've learned about these paintings. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the sort of interactive system that I've designed, um, because you'll all have the chance to use it. And so I think it helps to have some understanding you know, of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's designed with this painting. And the way that you know, a viewer interacts with it is simply by panning left or right, up or down, uh, using a joystick, like some of you had the chance to do beforehand, uh, and then also zooming in and out. And so what I've done is defined specific regions on this painting that are sort of characterized by uh, specific visual material. So things like you know, the brushwork, um, the, the washes up toward the top, some of the empty canvas, and just finding different categories of visual material. Uh, each of these categories is then associated with a family of musical material. And so, uh, as was mentioned, this is all from a recording of a Chinese string instrument called the guqin. Um, each, each type of visual material has sort of a family of music that goes along with it. Um, as you interact with the painting, so as you pan left and right, up and down, uh, different regions will come into view. You know, they'll, they'll enter the frame, move, and then leave the frame. Um, and as you zoom in and out, those regions will change in size. And so this information is used uh, to trigger which sounds are being heard, or which music you're hearing, uh, and then also the blend 
between that music. So you're sort of shaping what you're hearing as you sort of interact with the music. So I would encourage you when you have a chance to do it, experiment with zooming in and out. Um, and don't be afraid to zoom you know, very close in and, and really see the details. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to pass on to Zachary, who's another one of the uh, audio developers, part of the team. Sure. <coughs> thank you, Jack. So, thank you. Yes, I, I would like to introduce two key members of the team, uh, Zachary and Eric. Um, so uh, Zachary, uh, uh, is, this is part of the beauty of this residency is that, uh, you know, you, you, make, you meet new colleagues, you can collaborate, you also make good friends, you know. So um, Zachary is very much the architect behind this whole project. It's because of conversation with him that we developed these ideas and he helped me tremendously to put this whole project together. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Eric, uh, uh, Zachary, uh, uh, um, uh, couldn't stay in this institute, so Eric uh, come on board. Uh, so uh, I, this project would not be in here without these two very important uh, um, team members. So here's Zachary. Thank you. So um, I'd say I wrote a bunch of software for this uh, to support Lay's music, but I'd say that the biggest, the thing I'm most proud of with this piece is putting. You know, this is a really uniquely, deeply inter interdisciplinary, interactive uh, project, and I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Um, I first started working with um, Falco and his team as the lead researcher at a visualization lab in Saudi Arabia that was actually designed and staffed, uh, uh, designed by Peter Otto, the head of uh, Sonic Arts Research here, and Falco. Um, and so I've been working with, um, let's see, that's his poster. So from about 2009, I've been working on uh, graphics driven audio and you know how what are the issues how can you, you author media for a flat screen like this and deal with issues of scale and embed sound annotate sound inside of a large uh, media space like what you're seeing um, and we took that to a certain degree but we never you know my role in in at that lab was more uh, as a data sonification researcher not so much an artist and I always thought that the potential for really amazing uh, rich musical storytelling through this media space is there um, so when I first met Lay, um, I think that I met him for the first time in this room, actually. Um, we, uh, Sonic Arts, Peter Otto's team, Falco, uh, Tom Levy, um, a bunch of researchers here had banded together and um, designed a, uh, a Museum of the Future piece, basically. Some of you may have been here, actually. So we had, we had screens throughout the entire room, rich media everywhere, and it was all about the exodus. So we had a lot of different media on the wall. We were using audio and beam-forming beam sound, pointing sound in different directions, using computer vision. It was a kind of sensory, rich sensory experience. And Lay came in, and he was, uh, it was like a kid. It was, really, it was really amazing to see. He was really intrigued by all the things that you could do with the speakers and the combinations of, of audio and video. And, and we started talking about that. And I, kind, I think, in a way, that, that may have been the inception of this, you know, the technical inception of this, pro of this project. Is, awareness of what could be possible. So um, I started working with Lay to, you know, learn what he wanted to do with the residency and, and as he, you know, and it became clear that he had some, you know, some paintings that were so inspiring to him and he was, he was you know, thinking about orchestrational technique uh, based on, you know, different, uh, the different techniques of Juan Pin Hong. Um, I immediately thought that this, you know, he needs to be connected with Falco and we need to do something together. Um, so that's, that's the thing that I think I'm most proud of. I worked with them to, to define the project. Um, thankfully, as Falco said, Ramesh and Cal IT provided funding to make all of it possible because without that, none of this would have happened. Um, and from there, we started focusing on what, what kind of tools would we need to define, to allow Lay to develop a language based on this painting. Um, so Greg worked a lot on that as well, and Eric and myself also designed some tools. And rather than, um, we tried to, you know, not come with any pre-existing notions of what we should do. And I have to say something about that that's very inspiring with Lay. This is a composer that had, this is his fifth premiere this month. So he has, he, he's, you know, he doesn't have to change anything. He doesn't have to take chances. He is a very good composer. He, you know, he, this, is, this was a risky um, undertaking. Um, and I'm very inspired by that. I think that's something that, uh, you know, it's just very humbling when you have a composer who has such a developed language. He, he, he did this from the ground up. He developed a new language. And uh, right up until a few weeks ago, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fully developed. And he's continuing to develop it and take these ideas and move them into or orchestration and so on. So it's really been an amazing experience. So we, um, 
So yeah, so a few, just to, I don't want to go over too long, but just a few of the tools that we use behind the scenes. Um, MIAP uh, stands for Manifold Interface Amplitude Panning. So this is a tool that um, I developed that is, uh, it's kind of, it's based on some pre-existing pre software by a guy named Steve Ellison at Meyer Sound. Um, and fundamentally, it's a spatial, sound spatialization software. So that means uh, software that lets you take a sound and move it around in a space, right? Move it between, between different speakers. So what's unique about this tool is the approach to moving sound in space. And it's very, uh, it was um, really conducive to the way that, that Lei wanted to think about the space. So rather than, uh, oftentimes, Traditionally, when you move sound in space in computer music, you think about the sound as an extension of the space that you're in. So you, you say that sound should be there, and you use a 3D uh, uh, a Cartesian uh, coordinates to say there, and you're authoring an augmented reality of your space. What this tool does is it lets you abstract the space away onto a manifold, which is uh, um, otherwise a 2D manifold is a map. Like you take a globe, a 3D globe, and you flatten it onto a surface. So this is an abstraction of space that lets you define the relationships of the speakers in the room in any way that you want, create different topologies, and then use those um, topologies to move the sound around. Um, you can also use this as a control surface to change, uh, to interpolate between different things, to change lighting, to change effects. And so we, we use this tool uh, you know, um, in that way. And, and this is really the, actually, I'm proud to say this is the first use of, I, I released this software um, five months ago. And this is the first uh, and actually most interesting use of the software so far. So um, if you're interested in more about this, I have a video. I have a lot of stuff up on the website, but um, we can demonstrate any of this later. Um, Peter Otto and his team have a really amazing spatialization lab in this building. And, and myself and Eric, I'm sure, will be happy to talk more about it. I'm definitely going over, so really quick. Um, one of the other tools is something that has been a, a passion of mine for, actually, this dates to my an, original collaboration with CalIT when I was in Saudi Arabia. Um, large scale uh, graphics driven sound simulation. So this is a software that I call Stampede. So basically there are a bunch of difficulties when you try to take sound and, and uh, move it around a space, there is some computational problems and you, you, so there are limits in how much you can actually do. So I spent a lot of time focusing on that. I came up with a multi-threaded lockless approach. Anyways, it's, it's just uh, software that lets you lets you push lots and lots and lots and lots of sound in the space all at the same time. Um, and this uh, was something that Lay used. There were moments when you're hearing little flitting things fly around. Um, so we developed different approaches. Actually, he used this interface. He flew around a virtual space, um, put uh, the different record, uh, actually different process sound into that world, flew around, captured it, and then you hear it back in the space. Um, so. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, as Lay says, I defected. I left CalIT and, uh, before the end of this project, so um, I was really nervous about that. But thankfully, uh, Eric Hamden took charge, and he's a, he's a previous colleague, and actually I'm still collaborating with him. Um, and he has kind of taken this to, he t he's terminated it. He's, he's dealt with all of the difficult problems of, you know, now we've got the audio software, now we have the video software, how do we connect those together. How do we take this and make it something that Lay can actually make a piece out of? Um, he's done an amazing job with that. So um, again, if you're interested in any of the, you know, any more about the software, we can talk about that later. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'm sure Eric would too, but let me give it to Eric. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Zach. Uh, and thank, thanks to everyone, really. And thank you, Lay, for, uh, for everything. It's beautiful. So I'm um, glad to be here. I won't take a lot of time. Um, to talk. I just want to talk a little bit about my role in the project and some of the things that I developed and John is uh, thankfully pulling up some slides for me. So um, yeah, it's been a wonderful experience. So I came in um, after uh, a, a lot of great work had already been done uh, with everyone and uh, Zach had made some amazing tools for Lay to start composing with and, and building sounds with and really I took some of those tools and, and added on to them. Uh, this is one of the tools here. Um, this is a really cool patch that, uh, that Zach made called Blur and Pan. Um, and uh, it really relies on a, a piece of software he wrote to, that kind of does a smearing in time of sounds. It's very beautiful and it can be spatialized over lots of speakers like you have here. And so you heard that uh, tool in use in the piece. I added a little bit of a, um, and this is the right 
right one, right? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I added a little bit of an add-on here. So here you see a MEAP um, interface here, which uh, Lay used to author spatialization trajectories. And a request from Lay and a challenge was to be able to trace uh, the trajectories of uh, characters, or, or sorry, map, or sorry, trace characters to, to achieve trajectories for sounds, right? And so um, I added a little thing here where he could load pictures and scale them and move them around and, and trace them accordingly to his liking. Uh, but really, I think my main contribution is, um, is this piece of software over here. And this is kind of what I call Navigator, and I worked a lot a lot on this with Lay, and this was, uh, it's, it serves two purposes. It, it's actually being used tonight. It um, plays back everything, so it plays back the audio, and it also um, basically controls the virtual reality environment that's hosting the images. So it's all choreographed through this, and he authored it through this very piece of software, too. Um, and here's a screenshot of how Lay um, used this locally on his machine, and that was a big challenge in this project. So this is a really unique space and it's frankly hard to work in, and you can't really work in it all the time. So the challenge was how do you author for a space like this, for a wall like this, right, but at your laptop? So that, that was a, a really, really, really big challenge of the project, and thankfully with the team's effort and everyone's contributions, I was able to get Calviar running on the laptop, and uh, Lay was able to do this work, and here's an example of some of the scripting that happened to choreograph and uh, you know, audio playing back. And so this is kind of what I'm seeing when everything's playing back uh, back there. But uh, in summary, and then this little thing too uh, uh, helped c contribute some software for the controller as well, for the, the game controller. Um, that was my main role, and really, I, I don't have much more to say than that, but thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, <coughs> by now you all got a sense of the wonderful people I've been working with. Um, um, I'm a very, very lucky person. Um, so we have two more pieces to play for you. Um, the first piece is uh, basically it's the same um, uh, musical composition that you heard in the first piece, uh, annotating a different painting. Uh, and then after that piece, you will hear um, uh, Gregory's piece, uh, which is fully interactive. So he will be uh, in the back of the audience driving the image and the sound. Um, so at the end of that piece, uh, we will have a and a session. Uh, you're welcome to ask some questions. Uh, we, we do want to save some time for you to interact with the images as well. So after all of this is done, uh, we will uh, make the uh, controllers available to you. So anyone is welcome to stay and play with the images.
Okay, thank you. Um, can we have the, okay, thank you. Great, yeah. So yes, um, with that, uh, we finish our presentation part. We, we will have some question and answers. And at this moment, I would like to, um, um, John, if it's possible to load all of the presentation um, folders up, just in case any of the audience members uh, might have questions for any part of that. And um, I would also like to um, welcome the, um, the team members to, to come up uh, to stage, uh, including those who uh, didn't give a presentation to you today. Um, James, you're, I know you're around, and Zachary, uh, Eric, Samantha. And while they're coming up, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this uh, opportunity to be able to work with everyone. And um, it's a very inspiring team. We had a lot of fun. Um, yeah. um, I also want to thank CalIT, Qualcomm Institute, and Director Ramesh Rao uh, for making this possible. And the and, and the uh, CSRO grant that, that really helped to facilitate a lot of this. Um, and the Mojai Foundation, uh, who generously loaned the paintings for us to scan and share with you. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Oh yes, Professor uh, Kui Yishen, who, who helped us to identify uh, all of the 14 leaves of paintings, all those most important works that we must capture with the multispectral uh, imaging. Uh, yes, and my wonderful team and the wonderful staff here at CalIT. So I think everyone is here. Um, I, I uh, welcome any questions that you might have. Yes, please. Um, when, if you want to see the scan, when is the oh yes, I was going to save that for the end. Yeah, but thanks for that reminder. <laughs> yeah, so um, this presentation will be re repeated um, on May 2nd, which is a Saturday, 2.30 um, uh, in this room. Uh, it's going to be at the uh, uh, Art Power Filmatic Festival. Um, it will be a lot of interesting activities going on uh, for a three-day festival. So go to the Filmatic Festival website. You will get a lot of information. Um, so you, you're welcome to come here at that time to experience this piece again. Yes, Doug. Uh, yes, I, I noticed, of course, as Sam was saying, that there were uh, the uh, multispectral images captured. Uh, was it a, an artistic decision to not portray them as part of the to sort of travel through the, the paintings here, or? Yeah, well, I, would you like to say something about that? Well, it, um, that was my part? Okay, <laughs> yeah, it got too complicated. Yeah, we, we did, um, you know, I was inspired by that process, but in the end, so the interaction is not about uh, uh, seeing these different images uh, uh, while we are viewing the, uh, them right here but it's like my personal interaction with them. So I took some of the information from that multispectral imaging and applied it to, in the form of a, um, a filter for the sound, for example. Yeah, but in fact, yes, please, yeah. So uh, a lot of times the multispectral image process, taking the images and then sitting down and reading them very closely is what helps us learn about the artist process. And so Lei and I sat down and, and I, I showed him what I was seeing based on my experience in reading those images. And I said, look, here is where the paint is more absorbent. We think that this is where he's dotting with overnight paint. Or it looks like these washes were applied first and then this layer second. So that part was taken out of the multispectral imaging campaign. Um, and, and, and that was very influential in, in Lay's process to then compose the, 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 the pieces. But uh, one thing I can tell you that we also made a discovery um, with the XRF. And uh, I was taking the points almost everywhere to capture different features, the calligraphy, the black paint, the red. And I noticed that almost everywhere there's the presence of barium. And, and I said, what, what is this barium? Barium is not associated to any of these pigments. But what barium is, is it's a flat white reflector. And so you can't see it, but we could see it with the XRF. And um, we did some research, uh, both, both Lay and I, to read up about why someone would use barium. And, and it could have been used to change the absorbance of the paper and change the spreading properties of these watercolor washes. And so that could be the first time we've ever been able to see this in the work of Huang Bin Hong.
Okay, I'll just. Okay, no, here it is. So um, I was able to uh, um, find one of Huang Minghong's last students writing, documenting Huang Minghong's painting process, in which he mentioned there's an article from the early 80s printed with the wrong name and everything, so it's very hard to, uh, to, to dig it out. But in the end, we found when he described this process, he did mention that Huang Minghong uses many, many layers to paint different kind of ink, um, different kind of water. But uh, toward the very end of his process, he would always use um, a kind of a technique that would c he called it spreading water. So he would use this kind of a murky water, that, as the student described, to spread over the page. And we are guessing, since the presence of barium is prevalent on the page, this must be one of those secrets that Huang Minghong had, that he actually mixed barium, which is an imported uh, kind of a... Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a white, uh, barium okay. white or blanc fix, or there were a few names for it over history. Um, and also you can kind of see in some of the pictures uh, a line, a horizontal line in the very center of the image. And, and maybe after he put these, uh, this wash on, uh, he folded the paper in half. Because we can tell that, it's very intentional. Here it's showing up here, and you see the pigments are, are blending. It's right here. And, and, and we've seen this throughout the album. And um, in some of the UV images, it's even more prevalent, and uh, especially this one over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's coming right across, and, and we can see it also that, that red, red fluorescence area. So, so by taking the multispectral images and, and by reading them, oh, we were really able to inform the study and the process um, for this work of art. Right. Yeah. Yes. Do you think the artist himself actually folded it in half, or maybe someone else might have done that later? I would guess it's probably himself, mm -hmm. when it's still a little bit wet. Yeah, and one of my favorite images, I mean, we could go on and on, really, Every, everyone has, uh, there's so much that got involved in this project, but I want to just, <laughs> this is one of my favorite transmission image right here, if you can blow it really, so yes. I'll just describe, the transmission image is made by illuminating the, the um, paper from the back. So the light is placed behind and the camera is now in front. And so we can see through the paper. We can see the, the weaving of the, of the rice paper. And we can see I much more bright um, colors and potential. See, there's a little crack in the paper. I mean, things, things come out that don't come out in the, yeah. in the normal. And uh, John, if you can blow up this. No, no, um, make, make, uh, this area, can you make it bigger, please? Yes. Well, we're not only seeing a, a very rare collection of paintings that very few people in the world have seen them, uh, but we're seeing them in a way that is so unusual. Um, this corner um, uh, uh, is one of my, you know, it's, a, it's very uh, amazing for me to watch because um, on many different levels, one of them is that it's almost like watching a film. It's not just a painting. You're basically seeing the process of this painting. Because of this the transmission, light is from behind. You can see which layer he applied first. And um, it's these little very black dots on the surface. That's, that's what we call the overnight ink, the ink that doesn't blend with the rest of the ink. And it's because of application of this at the very end of his painting process that he creates a sense of illusion of almost like a, a, a 3D dimension, kind of a, um, it's, it's as, as if this, uh, this ink is actually uh, uh, a relief on the painting, kind of uh, doesn't belong, uh, doesn't blend with the rest. So this is something that, that uh, is very telling about Huang Minghong's invention, that uh, he, yeah, art historians joke about maybe he just dis discovered this technique because he didn't wash his ink tank. You know, <laughs> Next day he came back and then the ink already changed its quality and no longer blend, but it turned out to be a very powerful tool to use. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the process of composing. 
Yeah. Yeah, this project is very unusual because I, I, I normally um, don't compose music this way. But um, for Huang Ming Hong, uh, because of his, um, he's such a thoughtful, um, uh, very articulate, uh, a very articulate, articulated uh, 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 writer, the way he had, that he described his own paintings have been very inspiring to me. So in a way, I wanted to use his painting process as my compositional process. So uh, these are all the things that we could spend another hour to discuss. But basically, uh, you know, he starts with outlines, and then he will uh, 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 continue with uh, uh, splashing ink, and then he will have many, many different layers of textures. There are 200 kinds of textures in Chinese paintings. Um, so, and then he will finish with a, uh, a more water spreading, and then at the end he will apply the overnight ink, for example. So I wanted to create the compositional process that mirrors that process, which is something I don't normally do. And the other things that are very important for me is that Huang Minghun's theory about ink and water, and I wanted to find a sonic parallel to that. For example, how he blend uh, uh, to make wet ink versus the dry ink. And then uh, this, you know, that's where we're working on uh, with Greg, for example. He helped me to build these uh, spectral filters that help to make a sound more wet just because it helped articulate some of the uh, spectra of the sound that we hear. So all of these things become sort of like my own, I call it like sonic brush. They become my tools for me to paint. Then I can try to parallel his process and then create the last piece I will write for this uh, uh, multi-stage project is this 40 minute long orchestra piece in which I intend to use all of these processes that, that I learned from Hong Ming Hong and, and apply it to sound. Yeah. Maybe just one more question and then we should leave some time for you to interact. Any more questions for my uh, team members here? Well, if not, then um, thank you for being here. Uh, stick around and try to play with the images if you can. Thank you.